Okay, I have, it is noon, so it is time for us to start our webinar today. Um, I'm one of your hosts, uh, Lisa Johnson, horticulture educator from Dane County, and I uh, my colleague, uh, Darren, introduce himself quickly. I'm uh, Darren Kimbler. I'm the agriculture educator for Iron County. And our speaker today is Diana Alfu, who is horticulture educator from Pierce and St. Croix counties. And Diana is going to be talking to us today about apple pest management. All right. Um, well, Darren, if you could allow me to share my screen that says I am disabled right now. <laughs> um, and uh, we'll get started. So thanks everyone for joining us here. We're gonna talk about apple pests that you might have destroying your apple fruit in your, um, in your backyard orchard or, or backyard apple trees. As soon as we can, there we go. Get the slides up here. All right, so um, we're talking about the major apple pests that um, damage the fruit uh, in Wisconsin. And the main ones, there are three main insects, plum curculio, codling moth, and apple maggot, and um, one fungus, uh, apple scab. These are the major things that you're going to have. Uh, our goal here is not to get super in-depth about all of these. This is kind of a, in a nutshell sort of a thing. There are some other things that might damage your apples, like birds or hail damage, that sort of a thing. But for the most part, these are the pests that really break our hearts and make our fruit inedible. So we're going to talk about them uh, first so that you can learn how to identify them and figure out which ones you may or may not have in your fruit trees. And then then near the end of the presentation, we'll talk more about the control uh, method so that you can come up with a strategy that works for you. So the main thing to keep in mind is that it's really not the adults in most cases that are damaging the fruit, it's the larva. So the adult insect is looking at your fruit as a nice little nursery place to raise a family, and it's the larva that do the damage. Once the larva are inside the fruit, they cannot be controlled. So when we are looking at how to prevent this damage, we have to make sure that we are preventing those larva from getting inside. The first insect we're going to talk about is plum curculio. This is a native snout beetle or weevil. It um, has a, um, you can see the picture on the right hand side, it has a little snout on it that, that uh, um, it uses to uh, penetrate fruit. And uh, these are little critters. Um, they're about a quarter of an inch. The larva is maybe about a third of an inch. You'll hardly ever see the larva. They overwinter in wooded areas. They're the first insect that comes out and does the damage first. So if you have a wide open area with not a lot of uh, leaf litter or anything, you may not have a good overwintering site. So you might not have this critter, but if you live next to the woods, you might have the, uh, more of this problem. If you have wild plum trees around, you might have more of these around um, and they will come in and uh, crawl up and fly into your fruit trees. What they do is the female will actually get on the tiny little fruits. And these are when they're um, super, super small, smaller than the size of a dime. And she will make a little moon shaped slit in the fruit like this and lay the eggs underneath that flap. Um, the egg laying usually takes place in the two to five week period after the end of bloom. The eggs will hatch in about a week. And what's really weird about plum curculio is most of the larvae are gonna die. Um, if that fruit stays on the tree and keeps developing, the pressure from that developing fruit will actually squish and kill those larvae. So the larvae only develop in the fruits that fall to the ground and stop developing. But what we're left with on the fruit that stay on the trees are these scars. And they will um, be really kind of superficial because they're mostly on the surface, but they are something um, that damages the, the quality of the fruit. As the season goes on, those scars will get a little bit late larger. So if you see these uh, fan shaped or half moon shaped scars on the fruit surface, that's from plum, plum curculio. Now the good news is that you can pretty much peel those away. The fruit inside is fine. So this is probably the least important of our pests that we're going to talk about today. But 
um, if you're looking at blemishes on your fruit and you see these, that's how you identify that you have plum curculio. Plum curculio uh, uh, will also have a second generation. So those fruit that fall on the ground, those larvae will continue to develop, they'll pupate, and then they will fly around uh, later in the year and they will chew on the apples and they'll make holes actually in the fruit. So for that reason, you wanna make sure that you pick up any fallen fruit in the summer so that we don't get that second generation of adults damaging the fruit. Um, trapping these adults is not really been successful. So because they're so small, you may not even see that they're around until you see the damage on the fruit. The damage can begin shortly after petal fall. And again, you can see on the fruit here on the side, there's a little plum curculio damage already and that fruit is barely starting to swell. Um, the petals have just fallen off. So in order to know if you have plum curculio and need to do some kind of spraying or, or control for them, you want to start looking at the tiny apples right away. Look for those egg laying scars. You can also put a white sheet down on the ground and tap the branches and these little weevils will kind of fall out onto they're not like super mobile flying. Um, so they'll fall out onto the sheet and then you can monitor that you have them. And that will tell you that you need to be doing some kind of control. Those adults will be active for several weeks. So you'll probably have to do a couple of sprays in order to kill those adults so that they stop making those uh, egg laying damage sites on the fruit. The second one that we want to talk about is codling moth. And codling moth is more damaging. This is an actual little gray moth. You can see the picture there. They're about a half an inch long. They're active around sunset for a couple hours before sunset and a couple of hours after sunset. They overwinter as cocoons in leaf litter on loose bark. They might be like even on the trunk of your trees, but they'll also fly up to three miles in order to find a mating site and a, and a nice orchard to raise their young in. They'll emerge during full bloom, they fly around, they mate, they'll be active for about eight weeks and they lay their eggs on or near the developing fruit. So maybe on the twigs and leaves next to the fruit, maybe on the fruit itself, the eggs will hatch in about a week. And then there's tiny, tiny little larvae that you could barely even see on a tiny little apple. Um, they will feed on the surface of the fruit for a little while, a couple of days maybe, and then they'll burrow down into the fruit. So after about three or four weeks of eating inside the fruit, they'll exit, they drop to the ground and they'll pupate. And then we'll get another second adult flight in mid to late summer. One of the things that will tell you if you've had coddling moth are these little, they're called sting marks and they're just tiny little dots on the fruit. And this is where one of those larvae tried to tunnel in but didn't quite make it for one reason or another, either decided it wasn't a good place or just was unsuccessful for some other reason. So later on in the season, you might see just these little sting marks. They again are pretty harmless, not gonna um, get into the fruit and damage the fruit, but it's a sign that they were there. The bigger problem is the ones that do get in and they'll tunnel in and they head for the core of the apple. So they go and they feed on the flesh on the way in as well as the seeds at the core of the apple. This is the proverbial worm in the apple. The ones that get in will leave this um, little uh, entrance hole at the beginning of, at the um, entrance to that tunnel and it'll get kind of gunky and that's frass, which is caterpillar poop and juices and that sort of a thing. So if you see that on an apple, you know that there's probably one of these critters living inside of it. If the damage is bad enough, those fruit will fall to the ground. Some of them will stay on the tree all year long though. Um, but um, that caterpillar will feed for um, several weeks in there and then it will fall to the ground and pupate. With coddling moth, if you're using a spraying control, it's normally meant to, con to control the larva, the tiny little larva that are on the fruit, but that have not yet burrowed into it. So we have a pretty small window, usually in mid-May for that first generation and in late July for the second flight. Um, so we have to monitor for when those adults are out there and when they're laying eggs. So you can do that with these traps. You can get these traps that are little triangular traps. There's sticky stuff inside. They have the female pheromone in them. So the males will go in there and that will tell you that adult moths are active. And that'll be the time to spray to control those larvae before they burrow their way into the fruit. 
it's also super, super important that you remove any fallen fruit. So if your orchard or under your apple tree looks like this in summer, those fruit are falling for a reason. Sometimes the trees are just thinning themselves because they have a heavy load on it. Sometimes it's poor pollination, but a lot of times it's because there are pests, whether it's um, codling moth or something else in there that's damaged that fruit. But if those codling moth uh, caterpillars are in that, fruit on the ground, they're going to continue to develop and then they're going to hatch into that second uh, generation, that second flight in mid uh, to late July, and we want to avoid that. And then the third pest that we're going to talk about is apple maggot. Apple maggot is um, a little fly. It looks like this. It's got some interesting banding on the, on the wings. It's a little bit smaller than an average house fly, about a quarter of an inch long. These critters overwinter as pupa in the soil, uh, about two to three inches down, and they emerge last of our major pests here in late June to early July. So it's pretty late into the season. And if the soil is dry, they'll hang out and wait longer for good rain in order to emerge. And they emerge um, over time. So they don't all come out at once. And that makes it harder for us to control them because that continuous emergence means that they're out there laying eggs and needing to be controlled for a long period of time. Once the adults come out, they'll feed on things like pollen and honeydew and, um, uh, and then they'll start laying their eggs. When they lay their eggs, they basically, the female just um, sticks her little ovipositor right down in through the skin and lays the egg under the skin. On the surface of the fruit, it'll look just like a little pin prick, nothing um, super obvious. So you can see tiny little pinprick kinds of uh, blemishes on this fruit. They're very tiny. The egg is deposited under that skin, the larva hatches, and it starts tunneling through the fruit. And this will go all throughout the fruit and create those tiny little brown tunnels that we have all seen when we've bitten into an apple from our apple trees. Each larva will feed for about two to three weeks, at which point it will exit, drop to the ground, burrow down into the soil and pupate. So the symptoms on the outside of the fruit are pretty hard to see. They'll be tiny little dimples, um, but inside will be these brown tunnels. And as we um, saw with the coddling moth, the coddling moth goes right into the core and feeds on the seeds, makes a bigger tunnel. This is very distinctive that it's just these tiny little, um, sometimes it's called railroad tunnels because they're just damaged flesh. Um, so they're brown and they go all throughout, they meander throughout the flesh of that apple. And of course that's unsettling when you bite into it. It's also makes it really hard to store the apples for any length of time because they will start to rot if that damage is in the inside of the fruit. If you get damaged bad enough, if you get a lot of little larvae in there, which you can kind of see in this picture, the fruit will fall again. And um, then when that larva are ready, they will crawl out into the soil to pupate. So again, if your fruit is falling and it's looking yucky like this, there are larvae in there that want to turn into adults. So picking up that fallen fruit is a super important management uh, strategy that you should have. With apple maggots, there are a couple of traps that we can use. Um, some are to monitor and some are to actually catch the adults before they lay eggs. So there are the these yellow sticky traps that are um, for um, uh, monitoring that adults are present and they'll be coated with a sticky thing that has a sweet apple smell on them that will attract the adults that are out there flying around and mating but not yet ready to lay their eggs. These red sticky spheres will also have that apple smell on them but the ones that you catch on there are the ones that are ready to lay eggs because the flies lay their eggs not just by the smell, but by the visual red sphere that looks like a fruit. And so the ones you catch on the red spheres are usually looking to lay their eggs. Um, what this does is it tells you if you're catching a bunch of them on that yellow sticky trap that you should start spraying for the adults before they start laying their eggs. And um, you would spray based on how many adults you're catching on those traps. 
typically you're going to need to spray three to four times throughout the season because of that continuous emergence that we get of the adults. And um, the other thing is that you need to make sure that you're positively identifying the insects that are stuck on these traps because you'll catch a lot of things that are not apple maggots. So make sure that you are catching or identifying what's there so that you know for sure that you have adult apple maggots present. And then our other pest that we're going to talk about is a fungus, and that's apple scab. And you've probably all seen apples that look like this out in the orchard. Um, this is a fungus that overwinters on leaf litter in the springtime, just as things are the trees are starting to break bud. These spores will blow up off of the uh, leaves from last year. The spores blow in the wind. They land on the leaves of the of the new apple trees and on the fruit, and it. Uh, completes its life cycle and, and damages our, our trees. This is most severe in cool, wet years. So if we have a warm, dry spring, we see a lot less apple scab. Uh, last year was a, a warmer, drier spring, so we didn't have as much of it. But in a cool, wet year, we see a lot of this problem. Uh, this will affect both the leaves and the fruits on the trees. So this is kind of what it looks like on the leaves early on in the in the um, season, you get these little brown spots on the new young leaves. Those spots will continue to develop and later on in the um, season, they will produce spores that will re uh, land on other parts of leaves and make new leaf infections and also land on the fruit and cause the damage on the fruit themselves. Uh, so the conditions need to be, again, cool and wet. Um, so we want to keep our fruit as dry as possible. Um, if it's a warm, if it's above 78 degrees, there's usually not much infection of apple scab going on, but monitoring the weather will really tell you as well how much at risk your trees are for apple scab infection. One thing to remember with most fungi, including apple scab, infections have to be prevented. They cannot be cured. So by the time we have these spots on these leaves, we cannot cure these spots on the leaves. We have to prevent the infections in the first place. Heavily infected fruits will be really ugly. Um, you can see where apple scab gets its name when you look at this fruit tree here. Uh, the apples will be misshapen, they'll crack, and they'll rot, they'll fall to the ground. And these fruits, uh, our apple fruits, will be susceptible at all points throughout the year. So con uh, infections can occur throughout the growing season if conditions are right. Some varieties have resistance. Uh, for management, you want to do good spacing of your trees and good pruning. When you look at this picture here, you can see it's pretty thick in there. When the dew gets on there or it rains, it's going to take a long time for that to dry off, and that promotes fungal diseases, including apple scab. Also, cleaning up fallen leaves and fruit in the fall so that you don't have as, not, as much inoculum the next year is super, super important. All right, so that's how you identify what you have. Um, and it's super important that you identify what's causing your damage to your fruits before you try to implement any kind of control strategies. Because as you could see from this, the timing is very different. Plum curculio comes out first, then codling moth. Apple maggot isn't until the end of June. So spraying for apple maggot in May isn't going to do you any good. And then apple scab is something to monitor throughout the year and um, to determine how at risk your trees are. So now we're gonna talk a little bit more about the control strategies. With the insects, one of the major controls is traps. Now, for most part, traps are used for monitoring, to monitor when those adults are around and at what population. If you're only catching a couple adult insects, then your fruit probably isn't at great risk. And maybe you don't do anything other than uh, clean up to prevent that population from building up in the future. But if your traps are catching a lot of adult uh, insects, then it's going to tell you that maybe you need to do some kind of a control to kill those adult insects before they lay their eggs and damage the fruit. With apple maggot, as I mentioned, we can use both the yellow sticky traps that monitor that the adults are present, um, but 
it can also be effective to use a lot of those red sticky traps baited with the sweet apple smell to catch the egg laying adults so that they get caught on there before they find your smaller, usually smaller, um, developing apples. Uh, if you have one or two trees and you hang four or five of these red sticky traps in it, you might really minimize your damage from apple maggot. Keep in mind that traps never catch every single insect. Um, so you might still have some damage, but it can reduce it. The thing with apple maggot traps, again, is you have to make sure that you maintain those traps by cleaning them off, rebaiting them as necessary. Spraying is the second way that you can control these pests. Um, remember that the insecticides must be applied when the insects are present, whether they're in an adult stage, as with plum curculio or apple maggot, or with codling moth, again, we're trying to kill those tiny little larvae that are on the outside of the fruit before they tunnel their way in. So it's important that you're monitoring for the adults that you know when these stages of vulnerability are present so that you can control them appropriately. With sprays with fungicides for apple scab, they need to be applied before the fungal infection occurs. So you have to coat the fruit with the fungicide so that when the spore lands on it, the spore dies and is not able to um, penetrate the fruit and cause the infection. So with the fungicide, with the sprays, then they need to be applied um, periodically because they will wash off, they will um, uh, diminish with time, and the application times, how much you have to apply, will depend on the, the um, uh, weather conditions as well. So the um, instructions on the label might say apply every 7 to 14 days. If it's warm and dry, you can go 14 days. If it's cool and wet, you're going to be closer to that 7-day period. Synthetic and chemical or or synthetic chemical and organic options are available. So just because you're spraying doesn't mean that you're not able to be organic. There are organic sprays that you can use. We have a publication located at our website shown here called Apple Pest Management for Home Gardeners that will give more explanation about these pests and the sprays that are available. Um, so just remember that organic options often don't have as much residual effect and need to be applied more often. And then the last way of control is creating some kind of a barrier. And this prevents the egg from being laid on or in the fruit, um, or it prevents the spore from getting on the fruit. The first barrier that you can do is called, um, is using kale and clay. This has been around for a long time. One of the main uh, brand names is Surround. It's a super, super fine natural clay. You mix it with water, you spray it on the plant and you coat the fruit with it. And it creates a little barrier so that the spores and the insects can't get to it. It has to be applied regularly um, as the fruit grows or after rain because it will wash off. Uh, it's totally organic, but you do obviously have to wash it off the fruit before you eat it. And you have to spray it um, regularly. And then the last way to create a barrier is bagging fruit. This is becoming more and more popular. You basically put a little bag on the around the fruit when it's really tiny. So I've got a funky little model here on the on the picture on the right here, you take a plastic bag, you can buy bags that are made specifically for this, or you can just use a basic little uh, dollar store Ziploc bags, you put the developing fruit and this is when it's going to be really tiny, inspect it first, make sure plum curculio hasn't gotten to it already. If it's a good looking little fruit about the size of the dime, you put it in there, you'll want to staple it on both sides to make sure it stays on cut off the bottom of the bag so that any condensation can drip out throughout the year. And then you just let that apple develop all throughout the year until harvest. And that plastic is gonna create a barrier. You should have a perfectly organic, perfect apple by the end of the season. And you don't have to be doing any kind of the sprays or trapping that we talked about otherwise. So this is becoming more popular and a really good option. Um, so if you have more questions about this, again, check out our website. We have uh, a variety of um, um, Apple publications there, Apple Pest Management, Growing Apples in Wisconsin, as well as more information about each of these individual insects. So questions. Awesome, thank you, Diana.
Um, first of all, I want to let people know that I've put a number of links in the chat uh, that are to um, various publications about uh, the three insect pests. Um, so you can link to those there. Um, we will not be able to get all of the questions likely in a box, but um, we will get to as many of them as we can. And the number one question, Diana, is what to do with those fallen fruits? Can you compost them? Where should you put them? Um, is it bad to feed them to horses? <laughs> um, so you, whatever you do, you want them to not be able to let any larva in there develop. So you can bury them. If you don't have a lot, you can throw them in your trash. You can feed them to chickens. You could feed them to horses. Eating the larva isn't going to hurt anything, but whatever you do, you just want them to not, um, allow that larva to develop. And I should also mention that pears also get most of these pests as well, apples and pears being so closely related. So if you're having similar problems on pear, um, same rules apply. Okay, awesome. Um, there were also um, questions about, um, does thinning blossom clusters help with apple scab? It might if it's going to create more air circulation and then let the, the, the fruit that remains behind dry out faster. So very often, if you get a big cluster of apples, it can have a lot of moisture in between, which will promote apple scab um, infest, uh, infections. So it might if it's creating better airflow and faster drying. Okay, um, we have another one. We have a number of questions about um, pests and diseases that uh, we didn't have time to cover um, today. We do, again, have answers to a lot of those at a number of our different um, websites. Um, I do have another one about, let's see here. I tried the Ziploc bagging, but all fell to the ground. I think wind could be the problem. And can you use the Ziploc bag method for pears? Yes, you can use it on pears. Um, if they fell to the ground, there's always a chance that there was already something in that fruit that damaged it enough that the tree aborted it. If it hadn't been pollinated well, the tree might have aborted it. Um, so there might be other reasons that fruit fall to the ground. And so it's really kind of hard to say, but for the most part, we've had really good luck with those staying on all year. You just kind of have to explain to your neighbors what's going on because your tree looks so funky with all the bags in it. Sure. Um, okay, so somebody wanted to clarify oh, uh, about composting the fallen apples. And I think you said hot composting, but... If you, if you get them down into a compost pile and kind of buried with other stuff, the larvae are not likely going to be able to continue their development. But just throwing them on the top of a compost pile, those larvae will continue to develop and fly off as adults. Okay, um, I'm just going to break in here real quick. We only have two minutes left. Uh, I've been putting in the chat uh, the evaluation for this webinar. Please uh, take a moment uh, to fill that out so that we can bring you more webinars like this and uh, on topics that may be of interest to you. Okay, uh, do we have time for one more question here? I think so, we got two minutes. Okay, uh, maybe a couple then. Do the maggot traps work with the sticky trap applied only or do they have to be apple scented as well? Uh, they are best if they are apple scented to actually attract apple maggots. Um, and again, any of those sticky traps will, other things will land on them. And so you'll catch a lot of other stuff, but they should have the apple scent applied, yes. Okay. Um, and if I could just mention one, I did see it pop up too. Often we see uh, recommendations to hang like milk jugs with rotting bananas and molasses and stuff like that in there. Those really do not catch these pests. Um, these pests, again, apple maggot, not only when it lays its eggs, it's looking for that red sphere. So even though there's something sweet in that jug, it's not really going to um, catch these. It's certainly not to any effect that it's going to stop damage to your fruit. And it will catch a lot of other things other than these pests that actually damage your fruit. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, 
We have uh, reached the end of our time period here. Sorry, we could not get to all of those questions. Um, this program was being recorded. So at some point um, that should be available. And I wanna thank everybody for attending today.